it's wonderful to see all of you out there too, arrayed in all these tears. Um, I'm going to start with a poem called Sing Song. When I was young, the moon spoke in riddles and the stars rhymed. I was a new toy waiting for my owner to pick me up. When I was young, I ran the day to its knees. There were trees to swing on, crickets for capture. I was narrowly sweet, infinitely cruel, tongued in honey and coddled in milk, sunburned and silvery and scabbed like a cold. And the world was already old. And I was older than I am today. Another thing, when I was young, I, I was pretty good at math. It had all of the concrete answers, I thought. You know, you, there was an equal sign and things balanced. And then I hit geometry. <laughs> and it, I couldn't get past the fact that if you had a line, it went on forever. And I said, well, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, where is forever? And I got lost. So I went to my brother, who was two years older, and I said, come, you know, help me with this geometry. And all he did was stick me in his room and say, you'll figure it out. Just, you know, sit there. So I sat. And I realized that if you're sitting in a room, you cannot see, you know, the line. You see the line where the ceiling meets the wall, but you can't see beyond it. But you know it's there. And once you get past that, um, why not? Forever is just another little jump. <laughs> ah, geometry. I prove a theorem and the house expands. The windows jerk free to hover near the ceiling. The ceiling floats away with a sigh. As the walls clear themselves of everything but transparency, the scent of carnations leaves with them. I am out in the open, and above, the windows have hinged into butterflies, sunlight glinting where they've intersected. They are going to some point true and unproven. I think they're going to meet Billy's baby stars. <laughs> Dawn revisited. Imagine you wake up with a second chance. The blue jay hawks his pretty wares, and the oak still stands, spreading glorious shade. If you don't look back, the future never happens. How good to rise in sunlight in the prodigal smell of biscuits, eggs, and sausage on the grill. The whole sky is yours to write on, blown open to a blank page. Come on, shake a leg. You'll never know who's down there frying those eggs if you don't get up and see. That's a poem, I guess, about procrastination. I guess that's a poem about procrastination. Um, but this one is uh, called Golden Oldie, and I realize that with all of the recording devices that are out there now, this doesn't happen quite as often, that something is on the radio in the car, and it's a song that you remember, and you have to sit there until it's finished. Now you just plug it into your you know, phone and keep going. Golden Oldie. I made it home early, only to get stalled in the driveway, swaying at the wheel like a blind pianist caught in a tune meant for more than two hands playing. The words were easy, crooned by a young girl dying to feel alive, to discover a pain majestic enough to live by. I turned the air conditioning off, leaned back to float on a film of sweat, and listened to her sentiment. Baby, where did our love go? A lament I greedily took in, without a clue who my lover might be, or where to start looking. Billy 
this love poem inspired me to read this one too because at one point someone asked me, so well, how come you never write love poems? And I said, every poem's a love poem. It's a love poem to the world, uh, but they were they meant something more specific. And so I um, wrote this poem for my husband. It's a it's a love poem. It's an anti-love poem. I decided to take all of the cliches about the heart and use them in the poem. Heart to heart. It's neither red nor sweet. It doesn't melt or turn over, break or harden, so it can't feel pain, yearning, regret. It doesn't have a tip to spin on. It isn't even shapely, just a thick clutch of muscle, lopsided, mute. Still, I feel it inside its cage, sounding a dull tattoo. I want, I want, but I can't open it. There's no key. I can't wear it on my sleeve or tell you from the bottom of it how I feel. Here, it's all yours now, but you'll have to take me too. <laughs> This poem is, um, we're going to leap back about two centuries for this poem. Um, it's from a book called Sanan Mulatika, and it tells the story of a violin prodigy, a mixed race violin prodigy who lived in Europe in the 18th and 19th century, time of Beethoven. Uh, but this poem can stand alone, and so I wanted to read it to you. It is about another musician, because you didn't have recorded music at that time. You had to get your music live. The protagonist of the book, Bridge Tower is a 10-year-old boy. He's going off to play music, his violin, in the theater in London. And every day, he and his father, dressed in these extravagant kind of clothes that look like what people think Africans are supposed to look like, um, are walking down the street and they pass by a street musician because the people in the street wanted their music too. He happened to be black as well in London in 1790. And this is him as he is playing and watching the two go by. Black Billy Waters at his pitch. All men are beggars, white or black. Some worship gold, some pedal brass. My only house is on my back. I play my fiddle, I stay on track, give my peg leg, thank you sire, a jolly thwack. All men are beggars, white or black. And the plink of coin in my gunny sack is the bittersweet music in a life of lack. My only home is on my back. Was a soldier once, led a failed attack in that greener country for the Union Jack. All men are beggars, white or black. Crippled as a crab, sugary as sassafras. I'm Black Billy Waters, and you can kiss my sweet ass. <laughs> my only house weighs on my back. There he struts like a Turkish crackerjack. London cues for any novelty, and that's a fact. All men are beggars, white or black. And to this bright brown upstart hack among kings, one piece of advice. Don't unpack. All the home you'll own is on your back. I'll dance for the price of a mean cognac, sing gay songs like a natural born maniac. All men are beggars, white or black, so let's scrape the cat gut clean, stack the cords three deep. See, I'm no quack, though my only house is on my back. All men are beggars, white or black. was a Villanelle poem while that went on a little longer than most Villanelles. But um, my husband and I took up ballroom dancing long before Dancing with the Stars. And we have the bruises and the tapes and the liniment to prove it. It's really a sport. Um, the, the main thing about dancing, even the dancers that look so smooth and slow like the waltz, is that you have to look like you aren't suffering. Gotta make it look easy. It's a little bit about what life is like, right? American Smooth. We were dancing. 
It must have been a foxtrot or a waltz, something romantic but requiring restraint, rise and fall, precise execution as we moved into the next song without stopping, two chests heaving above a seven-league stride. Such perfect agony one learns to smile through, ecstatic mimicry being the sine qua non of American smooth. And because I was distracted by the effort of keeping my frame, the leftward lean, head turned just enough to gaze out past your ear and always smiling, smiling, I didn't notice how still you'd become until we had done it. For two measures, four, achieved flight, that swift and serene magnificence before the earth remembered who we were and brought us down. Thank you. I'll end with this poem. Um, I brought you up in the air, and now we'll do a little bit more mundane flight. This poem is called Vacation. I love the hour before takeoff. That stretch of no time, no home, but the gray vinyl seats linked like unfolding paper dolls. Soon we shall be summoned to the gate. Soon enough there'll be the clumsy procedure of row numbers and perforated stubs. But for now, I can look at these ragtag nuclear families with their cooing and bickering, or the healed bachelorette trying to ignore a baby's wail, and the baby's exhausted mother waiting to be called up early, while the athlete one monstrous hand asleep on his duffel bag listens, perched like a seal trained for the plunge. Even the lone executive who has wandered this far into summer with his lasered itinerary briefcase knocking his knees, even he has worked for the pleasure of bearing no more than a scrap of himself into this hall. He'll dine out. She'll sleep late. They'll let the sun burn them happy all morning. A little hope, a little whimsy, before the loudspeaker blurts and we leap up to become Flight 828, now boarding at Gate 17. Thank you.